Our next storyteller is often introduced as a great liar, <laughs> which he is. But among all those titles that he has won as a champion liar at the West Virginia Storytelling Contest, it's easy for us uh, to let those overshadow the level of commitment that he has given to the art of story. If you really study his work, you find an inspired mind that is equally adept at humor, wit, and social observation. The goodness of his stories places him in the line of superior and notable artists who know how to craft the great American adventure story. From James Fenimore Cooper to Mark Twain to John Ford, we find the next inheritor of that great tradition. Here in our midst, from West Virginia, is Bill Lepp. Thank you so much. Give you a minute to get used to my voice. <laughs> Y'all went, aww, at the end of Claire's story. But all I could think was, no wonder elephants are endangered. <laughs> so we are sitting at the top of Weberwood Hill. Weberwood Hill is the hill that I grew up on in some of my stories. <laughs> and Weberwood Hill is almost a mile from the top of Weberwood Hill to the bottom of the Weberwood Hill. And the first third of Weberwood Hill is almost straight up and down. And then it sort of flattens out a little bit at Claired Circle. And the last third of Weberwood Hill is even more almost straight up and down than the first third. And at the bottom of Weberwood Hill, there's a curve. And when I was a kid, we would have called it, well, we did call it Dead Man's Curve. But now we know that children are much too sensitive for that sort of language. <laughs> so now we would call it something like Wicked Timeout Curve. <laughs> and if you missed the curve, you went off the road and there were about 10 trees and then there was a cliff, a 14,000 foot cliff. And at the bottom of that cliff, there was a pool of inky black liquid. And our parents told us never to touch that liquid. They said, if we ever touch that liquid, you have to understand that in Charleston, West Virginia, for about 40 miles down the river in the 70s and 80s, there was nothing but chemical companies. And all of those chemical companies were environmentally conscious. And by that, I mean they were conscious that the environment was there. <laughs> and that that would be a good place to dump waste. And all of that waste went down to that pool. And our parents told us that if we touched it, it would eat the flesh off of our bodies. And then they told us if we went swimming in it, that we would wake the mer creatures, the mermaids and the mermen who lived at the bottom of that pool, and they would swim to the surface and they would eat the flesh off of our bodies, and we thought, well, that's inconsistent. <laughs> because you told us the liquid would eat the flesh off of our bodies, therefore the mermaids would have nothing to eat, they must be starving to death, and we felt bad about that, but we had other things to do. So, <laughs> we were sitting at the top of Weberwood Hill, we were on our bicycles. We were getting ready to ride our bicycles down Weberwood Hill, and the goal was to pedal the entire way down to be in 10th gear by the time you got to my house and to never touch your brakes. And the reason we wanted to do this is because we thought if we could pedal all the way down Weberwood Hill, we could build up enough friction on our sprockets that we could set our chains on fire. <laughs> and the reason we thought we could set our chains on fire is because Nora said we could. Now, Nora was a girl in our neighborhood. She was the smartest girl in the neighborhood. She was the funniest girl in the neighborhood. She was the classiest girl in the neighborhood. She was the prettiest girl in the neighborhood. 
And so when Nora said things like, if you pedal hard enough, you can set your chains on fire. See, we were right at that age when boys start to think to themselves, well, if girls have cooties, maybe cooties aren't such a bad thing to have. Well, I just want to know what cooties is. <laughs> oh, you just spell it? There's not, oh. You always disappoint me, Liz. So, <laughs> when Nora said stuff like, you can set your chains on fire, all the boys in the neighborhood were like, uh-huh, Nora, you're pretty. We'll do it. <laughs> Which is not something boys ever uh, grow. So. There we were. Now, to be honest with you, I did not want to set my chain on fire. I just wanted to know the kid who set his chain on fire. Because when I was growing up, whenever I was about to do something stupid, my dad would run in the room. And some of you are thinking, well, gosh, when did he get anything else done? But that, <laughs> that is hurtful. <laughs> but he would run in the room and he'd be like, no, 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 never try and cut glass with scissors. <laughs> Dan Carlisle tried to cut glass with scissors. The glass broke, he cut his hand off, he was never the same afterwards. Her dad would say, no, 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 never tie your sled to a moving car. <laughs> Dan Carlisle tied his sled to a moving car, the car stopped, Dan didn't, he hit his head, he was never the same afterwards. Her dad would say, no, 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 never put a slug in your ear. Dan Carlisle put a slug in his ear. He was never the same afterwards, ate his brain. Now, I could never follow the chronology of poor Dan's life, but I know for a fact that he was never the same afterwards. <laughs> so I didn't want to set my chain on fire. I just wanted to know the kid who set his chain on fire. So I could say to my children, no, 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 never set your chain on fire. So-and-so set their chain on fire. They were never the same afterwards. And my chief candidate was a guy named Elmore Lofink. Now, here's what you have to know about Elmore. Elmore played t-ball for two years. <laughs> yeah, remedial t-ball in our country. That's worse than getting held back in school. And you, you understand t-ball, right? There's a t. It's about this tall. You put a baseball on it. The baseball's just sitting there. It's not moving. It's not coming at you at 90 miles an hour. It's not sinking, it's not sliding, it's not corkscrewing, it's just sitting there. Two years. <laughs> Elmore never got a hit. <laughs> he went over the ball, the little rubber thing under the ball, he set that over the second baseman's head on several occasions. But the ball just went thunk. And now I have to say, when I take my children to play t-ball, right, we sign them up, and the coaches and the other adult people were like, okay, here's how it works. Um, there are no outs. Everybody gets to bat, and we don't keep score. And I said to my kids, I said to my kids, when I played t-ball, there were three outs, and not everybody got to bat. And if you got a hit, maybe you made it to first base. And if you were lucky, you got to second, and then the third, and home. And if you got all the way home, somebody made a mark in a book. And we called that a run. And at the end of the game, each team counted up those marks. And whichever team had the most marks, that team won. I told my children, remember, if nobody wins, everybody's a loser. Except someone's going to win the election and we're all going to lose, but... <laughs> but where was I? <laughs> right, so Elmore had graduated from the bicycling arts, or from the baseball arts to the bicycling arts, and of all the kids in the neighborhood who wanted to set their chain on fire, Elmore most wanted to set his chain on fire. Because of all the people in the neighborhood who had a crush on Nora, Elmore had the biggest crush on Nora. Elmore wanted to date 
Nora. He wanted to stand beneath her window with a fiddle and serenade Nora. He wanted to, he wanted to write her love poems like, Nora, Nora, how I adore you. <laughs> he wanted to get her to sneeze three times with nobody saying, bless you. <laughs> he wanted to marry Nora. He wanted to have a thousand children with Nora. He wanted to spend the rest of his life with Nora. And Nora did not feel the same way about Elmore. <laughs> Elmore thought if she had to spend the rest of her, Nora thought if she had to spend the rest of her life with Elmore, maybe they could be neighbors. <laughs> if there were a couple of houses in between. But Elmore was certain that if he could set his chain on fire, he could win Nora's heart. So Nora said, go, and we started off down the hill. Now, we were not wearing safety gear. I was the last generation that could go out and play properly. <laughs> but I, yeah, we clap. We clap like it's nobody's fault, right? Like somebody, some adult came up with safety gear. A kid didn't, because now we're like, we tell our children, why don't you go out and play? Put your video game down. Go out and play. And so the kid's about to go out and play. And then we're like, wait, safety gear. And so we put on the safety gear. And then we're like, sunscreen. <laughs> And then we're like, bug spray. And then we're like, what are we supposed to put on first? And then we're like, hydrate. And then the kid has to go to the bathroom, and then it's supper time. So no wonder. I was putting my daughter on the bicycle when she was little, you know, the little seat on the back. So I put her helmet on, and then her little gloves, and then her elbow pads, and her knee pads, and her shin guards and the Kevlar vest. <laughs> Until all you could even see that she was a human was this much of her face. And I put her on the bicycle and I got ready to get on the bike and I swung my leg over, bam! <laughs> not, not on purpose. That didn't really happen to me. I read that in Reader's Digest, but I thought it was funny, so I stole it. And that, young people, that's how you cite a source. So, <laughs> but we were, we were the last of what Andy Off and Irwin calls the bicycle generation. We could go anywhere in the world on our bicycle so long as we were home for supper. If you wanted to go shoot pool in a smoky blues hall in Memphis, nobody cared. Long as you were home for supper. Shortly after breakfast, our adults would say, go away. And we were not expected home until supper time. And if, if, if once your mother said that to you, you said, okay, I'll go. But can I have a box of matches and a stick of dynamite? <laughs> she would be like, be careful. <laughs> Remember what happened to Dan Carlisle. When I was a kid, only four kinds of people wore safety gear. Firefighters, construction workers, uh, professional football players, and astronauts. If your job did not include having an I-beam dropped on your head, running into a burning building, purposely hitting another human being, or re-entering the atmosphere. <laughs> if you wore safety gear, you were sort of a wimp, and that's all there was to it. But plus, we didn't need safety gear, because we had something children don't have now. We had something called tough skin blue jeans. Tough skin blue jeans were made by the Sears and Roebuck Corporation. They were made from DuPont Tri-Bond 490 polyester. <laughs> they had reinforced knees. The sales slogan was, your children will outgrow them before they wear them out. I was the last of five children, which means I did not own a new article of clothing until I was 27 years old. And by the time the tough skins got to me, the knees were still reinforced. Everybody walked around the neighborhood like they had just peed their pants. <laughs> and tough skins were that dark shade of blue, and so you couldn't tell. And those things, <laughs> they were bulletproof. You could be going down the highway in the back of a pickup truck, 80 miles an hour, totally legal. Your dad hits a bump. <laughs> One kid goes flying out, hits the concrete. That child would be fine if they were wearing tough skins so long as they just kept from their hips to their ankles on the highway. They just slide down the highway. The only thing that could possibly go wrong is if you had one of these little metal rivets and sparks started to come out. <laughs> if you were beside a tanker truck, 
and that tanker truck were leaking, you know, boom. But you'd be fine. Well, no, you'd be gone from your waist up and your ankles down. But anything covered by the tough skins would be fine. So we're going down the hill. We're pedaling as hard as we could. We're probably asking yourself, how, how, how could you pedal if you couldn't bend your knees? Well, <laughs> don't overthink the story. And I was... I was trying to remember front brake, back brake, front brake, back brake, because if you're going down a hill like this at 800 miles an hour and you hit your front brake, yeah, you're going to cartwheel. And so we're going down the hill, and now Nora, Nora was a little bit behind us. Now, Nora couldn't set her chain on fire because we never knew why, but when Nora was born, her legs had never worked. She had been in a wheelchair her entire life, but she was the kind of kid that when she said to her parents, I am going to ride my wheelchair down the hill, they did not say, oh, gosh, Nora, we think that's a poor idea because they had known her her whole life, and they knew she was going to do it anyway. So they said things like, oh, Lordy, we better take a welding class. <laughs> and so they welded her a wheelchair that looked like the inside of a NASCAR race car. It had big steel pipes welded together. There were big, fat off-road tires. She had a plexiglass windshield, nets on the side, a steering wheel, a seat with a 27-point harness system and a, and a handbrake. And because she couldn't set her chain on fire, she just had lengths of chain hanging out from behind her bicycle that would slap into the ground, and great plumes of sparks would fly up from behind her. So Nora was a little bit behind us because she just had to depend on gravity. And already some children were chickening out. I could hear them saying things like, oh, I believe I hear my mother calling me for the noon repast. <laughs> I must return home. But we were going down the hill, and I was looking for dogs. Now, I'll tell you why I was looking for dogs. Because my father said to me, you have to be careful on those bicycles because those tires are razor thin. And if you hit a dog, now, I know there are some children people in the tent. I can see some right here. Children people, just raise your hands if ever in your whole life an adult has said something to you. Just pretend your adults aren't even looking at you. They're probably not anyway. Uh, <laughs> just raise your hand if an adult has ever said something to you and you thought to yourself, I understand that what that adult is trying to communicate, well, they think they're trying to communicate useful information. But what that adult just said is the single stupidest thing I have ever heard. <clears throat> yeah. And I'll tell you what happens. It creeps up on you slowly, but it's going to happen to you just like it happened to the rest of us. You've seen us standing around, right? Us being adults. We're just standing there like, huh? Like the world's moving way too fast, and we're looking at the young people, and we're thinking, I, have, I must have something to share with them. And we'll get an idea in our head. It'll bloom like a tulip. It'll be like, eh, and it'll be like, I am a good idea. Find a young person. Share me with a young person. So we go, and we find a young person, and we're like, young person. And we start to say it, and it's up here, and it goes smart, smart, smart. And it comes down through our brain, smart, smart. And it comes out our mouth, smart, smart. And about halfway between our mouth and your ears, it goes dumb, dumb, dumb. <laughs> so my dad said to me, you have to be careful on those bicycles because those tires are razor thin. And if you hit a dog, you will cut the dog in half. And when he said that, all I could think was, I want to hit a dog. <laughs> and it's now that I don't like dogs. I love dogs, but maybe it could re be a rabid dog, you know, like an Atticus Fitch thing, read a book. And Dad meant, if you hit a dog in the side, I wanted to hit a dog in the nose and just see if I could split it. <laughs> right down the middle. So we're going down the hill. Pedaling as hard as we could. I'm in 10th gear. Elmore's in 10th gear. We get to Claire's Circle where it sort of flattens out. By now, more people are chickening out. Oh, I believe I'm having mechanical difficulties. I must pull to the side. So when we got to that last part of the hill, the part that would almost entirely straight up and down, it was just myself and Elmore left with Nora 
just a little bit behind us, and I could smell hot metal. As we started to descend the last part of the hill, I could smell hot metal. It was like standing next to an old radiator or being beside a car that someone had just shut off. And I looked down to see if my bike was on fire. And it didn't even seem to be hot. There was, there was no sign of any heat at all. But I could still smell hot metal. So I looked over at Elmore's bicycle. And Elmore's sprocket was glowing bright red. There were heat waves shimmering off of it, bouncing off his tough skin blue jeans, going up into the atmosphere, burning a hole in the ozone layer. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, whoosh. 80 feet of flame shot out from behind Elmore's bicycle. It was like the afterburner on a jet fighter, and he was so excited he was screaming, I'm on fire! I'm on fire! And he turned to look at Nora, and he said, Nora, I'm on fire for you! And the symbolism was lost on us, but there it was. And so... We had done it. We had done it. So I started to break. Back break, back break, front break. Elmore started to break. Back break, back break, front break. And then shoo, Nora shot in between us, going 700 miles an hour. <laughs> Something had gone wrong. Her brakes were out. There was no way she could stop. There was no way she was going to make it around wicked timeout curve. She was <laughs> going to go off the road through the trees, off the cliff, into the pit, and we didn't want that to happen because we liked Nora. But I didn't know what to do. And then Elmore did the bravest thing I've ever seen. Elmore let go of the brakes on his burning bicycle, and he started to pedal as hard as he could. And I let go of the brakes on my bicycle. I had to see what was going to happen. And just before, <laughs> just before Nora went off the edge of the road, when all that separated for her from certain doom was that thin white line on the edge of the road, Elmore whipped in front of her and did a move that spawned the X Games. Elmore <laughs> grabbed his front brake as hard as he could, and he stood his bicycle up on its front wheel, and he wiggled his hips so that he spun his bike in a great 360-degree arc, and the back wheel of his bicycle hit the front of Nora's wheelchair and sent it rolling back up the hill. Here was a child who could not hit a baseball. sitting stationary in front of him on a windless summer afternoon who had just rotated his burning bicycle to knock a wheelchair back up the hill. And I jumped off my bike, I grabbed Nora's wheelchair and I kind of ran it to a stop and the three of us were just there over Elmore's bicycle. It was just laying there like a head with its chicken cut off. And we watched as that bicycle melted into the asphalt, breathing the sweet asphalt fumes, which goes on to explain a few things. And when, <laughs> when it was all gone, when there was nothing left but some bubbles and some aluminum ash, somebody called the fire department. <laughs> they were coming this way. When it was all gone, when there was nothing left, Nora turned to Elmore, and she looked at Elmore with a twinkle in her eye, and she said in that tone of voice that only girls can use, and it's a tone of voice that girls can use that can make boys do anything. And I'm looking at some of you young ladies in this tent, and I imagine some of you have already discovered this voice, and some of you are on the verge of discovering this voice, and all I ask is that you use it for the powers of good. <laughs> because it's a voice that girls can use that can make boys do anything. And Nora looked at Elmore with a twinkle in her eye and she said to Elmore, she said, Elmore, you can push me back up the hill.